KP Ready with RCMS Group, the nation's leading provider of building information modeling to the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. My name is Susie Spivey Tilson, and I am the director of the Sustainable Studio at TVS Design. We are an Atlanta based architecture, interior design, and land planning firm. We have offices in Atlanta and Chicago and Dubai. Hi, I'm Jason McFadden with Barton Mallow Company, a project manager specializing in general construction, construction management, uh, pre construction design build services uh, nationwide. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work on several lead projects and uh, part of our BIM initiative uh, with our company. I'm Dennis Creech. I'm the executive director of the South Face Energy Institute. South Face is a nonprofit that works to promote sustainable homes, workplaces, and communities through education, research, advocacy, and technical assistance. I'm Brad Higdon with BDR Partners. Our firm is a, a consultancy that specializes in helping clients with their real estate needs, specifically uh, strategic planning and program management to deliver the buildings that meet their needs. There's, there's so much opportunity in BIM <laughs> to, um, you know, to really look at building performance and energy performance, but also I think, um, you know, you talked a lot about teams working together and, and integrated design being enhanced that much more because of the abilities that BIM has, but I don't know that the folks who are using BIM are, you know, as, a, as effective at, it, at using it or as efficient at using it as, there's a, there's a big learning curve still, I think, to go through, and, and BIM, I think, is going to be a great tool. Unfortunately, what, you know, what we try to, what we see in terms of BIM adoption is um, the good news it's being adopted, the bad news it's being adopted by, in, in firms, by people with the least amount of knowledge and experience um, because of the gee whiz effect of the technology that the 20 something year olds get very involved in building these great BIM models, but they've never actually stepped foot onto a job site. Um, so our, one of our challenges to our customers has always been let's get the folks that have 30 years experience involved in the process and, and less of this us and them. Uh, we see in firms there tends to be the BIM folks that are the, the younger generation and then there's the experienced folks and they, they say things like, yeah, we have a BIM department, they're over there. Um, <laughs> I think in many ways BIM is a template much like energy modeling or green building overall. To, it's a template for integrated design. Um, and so it, when you, it, it, it's forcing a discipline to get the more senior experienced people involved in a project early on. You're getting all of the stakeholders, if you will, around the table to make important decisions. And so, and, and that's really the success to green building um, overall is this you know, integrated design. Uh, it's not uncommon for you know, these kinds of processes. It's the first time that, that all the principals ever meet on a project is when they're having to do this, this quote, modeling approach, which is really um, a metaphor for integrated design. I think the reality of what, you know, when we talk about BIM, people get really focused on 3D, um, which is it's interesting. It makes for great PowerPoint, but um, it really has to do with data. And I think as, as time goes on, um, the, the management of data and the sharing of data and, and, and the analytics are what's going to be important when we talk about how did a building perform in design versus actual, and you start collecting that data, and you start creating a knowledge base, then you can use that data uh, down the road. So from, you know, we deal with a lot of product manufacturers, and, and they're very intrigued about what BIM means to their business. Um, and right now, they're treating it much more around marketing. You know, how do we, um, you know, instead of downloading a PDF of cut sheets, you download a BIM object, um, which is interesting, but not necessarily the end goal. Um, I also think if you look at how fragmented construction is in terms of all the parties and um, the products that go into a building, how are they contributing to design? Right now they're kind of on a shelf somewhere or they're in a database somewhere. Is there, will you start to get more innovation around customization of products uh, because they're involved in the design process at some it's point? like achieve, trying to achieve LEED certification requires a greater degree of collaboration between the architect and the engineering disciplines as well as the owner in terms of saying, here's some options, how do we evaluate those? How does the owner make decisions about where to spend money based on a return for his dollar? Um, BIM, in the same way, require, it creates an opportunity, anyway, for collaboration 
um, and between the project team and especially between the design team and the contracting team that integrates the process. So I think both sort of the, trying to achieve lead and the use of BIM are both integrating the design right. process. Uh, they can't. They can't. When they're done, yes. when they're <laughs> approached correctly. Yeah, and I, I think we, we talk about it in our firm all the time is we, we, we ask the question, what is the deliverable? Where we get really focused on that word deliverable a lot. And I think what BIM is going to do is change the design community's world in terms of view of the deliverable being a set of drawings and specs and the deliverable being the building. And I think BIM really kind of gets them closer to that being the deliverable versus, you know, just the contract documents being the deliverable. And I think once you get everybody focused on that being the, the end, end game is the building, it, it makes a difference. And don't you think both tools too, speaking of deliverables, you know, for the architect, the deliverable is when the building is finished construction for the contractor a year after that. Um, really both tools um, talk about really the life cycle of the building and the deliverable is that life cycle as opposed to just what happens at the, the water's edge at, you know, at the end of construction. No, I think so. I mean, I think, like, like when you look at firms, if you look at the majority of the people that are, you know, because most architecture firms that we walk into, you know, we walk in and they're all still there when we walk out at seven o'clock at night. So, <laughs> but if you look at what is everybody spending their time on, you know, majority of the staff in terms of deliverable, there's a lot of focus on got to get the drawings out, got to get the drawings out. And there's a lot of focus around that deliverable. I think um, with BIM, it also gives them good data around the future of what their deliverable is, where it's going to end up. I mean, you're seeing a lot of innovation. It all comes from data. I mean, if you, once you have data to be able to do any, there's lots of smart people creating lots of smart software mm -hmm. to start looking at giving knowledge, uh, knowledgeable designers or contractors data to say, what does this predictability look like? You know, what, what is the predictors? of this building, where are we going to end up? I mean, you're seeing it even with, um, with planning in terms of people modeling out whole communities and saying, well, what's this community going to look like in 30 years based on the data we know today? I, I do think there's a sort of, it's, BIM exists, there, there, you know, there's software tools and it's how you use the tool. A lot of people are using the tool because of, of sort of the modeling output that they can achieve. I do think, uh, at least in my experience, what I've seen happen with BIM in an architectural office is that um, really, in order to apply the thought and to get the data into a model that, that, um, that BIM can achieve, it's really the more experienced people in your office that have to bring that knowledge to the, to the table. And, and so I, in offices where the um, more experienced folks become users, I think what you see is a, a really a much nicer product than what you see in other offices where maybe it's just more or less being used as a modeling tool. So I do agree that experience counts in the output <laughs> more so than in other areas. You know, uh, from the, the construction aspect, we, we look at the knowledge from, from our subcontractors. So we, we rely on them to, to develop their expertise of a BIM model, whether it's a structure or an MEP system. And then we're just the, the integrator of how to implement those models for coordination or for submittals, RFIs punch list, et cetera. So you know, that, that's how we use it as a tool if the design team isn't uh, quite up to where they need to be. What requires is kind of ubiquity of technology. I mean, if you look at email, email only became interesting when executives finally had BlackBerry. You know, if it, if it involved them sitting at their desk and checking email, mm -hmm. uh, I remember as little as five years ago when my relatives still dictated email to his secretary. <laughs> and she printed it off and left it on, her, on his desk. You know, then he get, gets a BlackBerry. Now all of a sudden, technology's right in his pocket. It's ubiquitous. He knows how to use it. Um, it's not this magical thing that the IT department does. Uh, and I think we we have a ways to go, but I think we're getting there in terms of putting data and knowledge in the hands of people that have the most experience to make decisions.